of your life. Hey everyone, welcome to the CTO Coin 2023. My name is Salha Masood. I'm the co-founder and CTO at RemoteBase.com. Uh, well, today's topic is about maximizing the power of data, uh, strategies for driving business insights and innovation. Uh, as you all know that big data is pretty important. It is a pretty important component for a lot of businesses out there. Uh, but uh, using big data does come with a lot of challenges. So in today's discussion, we'll be talking about some of the challenges that leadership face, you know, leaders face around the world while using big data and some of the ways, uh, you know, some of the solutions to those problems as well. We'll also talk about uh, how leadership can leverage data uh, to drive real business value. So before we get started, let me introduce our esteemed panelists for today. So we have Jay Sen, who's the director, data engineering services at PayPal. By the way, Jay is a really good friend of mine. We've met before as well. Uh, welcome, Jay. We have Mike Fisher, who's the advisor, EDSY. And finally, we have Saba Al Hila. She's the VP of engineering at Unbounce. I'm a big fan of Unbounce. Uh, welcome, guys. Uh, let's get started. Uh, so the amount of data uh, being generated worldwide is expected to be 175 zeta bytes by 2025. So what are some of the challenges that organizations face in leveraging big data effectively and you know, some of the strategies to overcome them? Uh, Jay, why don't you go ahead and start? Sure. Um, you know, I think it, it really depends on the organizations and, and challenges are, are, you know, ranges all the way from, you know, whether it's an organizational structure of the, for the big data stack mm -hmm. or the budget and investment into the data stack. And, mm -hmm. you know, as we, as we go from all the way from there, it can be as simple as lack of talent also, you know, sometimes adoption of the big data technologies for the organizations. Right. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> As you move up the stack in, in terms of the larger organization, the challenges are you're collecting a lot of data, as you said, but you know, we mm -hmm. are not, not sure how to leverage it or mm -hmm. whether we're leveraging it, then you know, we don't know whether it's, how, uh, whether it's effective and how much it is helping to the business. You know? So mm -hmm. and all of this, I think the bigger challenge for, uh, that I've seen recently is you know, the mm -hmm. overall trust in the data that we collect. And, mm -hmm. and to know that, you know, how to leverage it and whether it is giving me the right answers or not, you know? So mm -hmm. the producer, for example, is, we collect a lot of data, but then mm -hmm. the consumers like analyst or data scientist does not really understand how this is collected, how this is organized, mm -hmm. and maybe using mm -hmm. it. So all of this leads to a, you know, I would say almost a misalignment in the data strategy for the company. And mm -hmm. that lead to further more issues like, you know, you can have a new distribution of investment in the each of the teams. Um, every team's now operating differently at a different velocity. Mm -hmm. So overall mm -hmm. end to end, you know, the, your left hand is not rocking to right hand in, in very organized and an effective manner that leads to mm -hmm. all of the effect of not being able to leverage the data effectively i feel that would be my short answer not, but you know the, yeah, the, not being the, able to mm -hmm. right and, Sorry, and sir, deep, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. deep dive into each of this and and you know uh, more detail on each of these topics it's pretty interesting yeah i mean uh, all of these topics are pretty interesting but uh, mike i'd also want to hear you out on this one so what are your your thoughts yeah i'll pick up where, where jay sort of left off there on the organization i think and and as you mentioned there are like there's so many broad areas that are challenging that we can dive into any of these, but one I would say is organization. Who owns what data? Who uses the data? That's a, a first challenge with within you know companies today. Uh, Jay also mentioned I think a little bit of budgeting, but cost is is a mm -hmm. big issue that we can dive into about how to properly mm -hmm. manage the cost, how to ensure you get a proper ROI on your data, mm -hmm. um, and all of the you know, the budget of that. That's a big area. For some companies, the technology, and I would say the skills and technology that are going from a lot of batch processing into real-time streaming, that's an area that I think is challenging. And then the last that I would talk about is there's a hierarchy of data. And you know, at the bottom is the collection of data. It's then you know, the ETL of moving and transferring and storing, and eventually use it of, in reporting and, and starting to get um, insights Use it then to make decisions like A/B experimentation. Mm -hmm. Finally, get into really sophisticated like use of machine learning. 
And people who aren't aware of that hierarchy want to jump to the top, right? They want to jump right mm -hmm. to something very sophisticated instead of mm -hmm. understanding you, this is a hierarchy that's got to be built up. The skills, the knowledge, the expertise, hierarchy. all that's built on top. So I think that's yeah. a big challenge that companies are going to face. Pretty, pretty interesting, yeah. Pretty interesting the way you mentioned streaming services and all. So that's a good analogy. 175 zettabytes of data. Sabah, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, I mean, outside of the data operations challenges that both Jay and Mike touched on, I think the bigger um, challenge that you know com companies and businesses are going to run into with leveraging their data mm -hmm. is setting a data strategy that already aligns with their product strategy and what is like the value to customers, right? With some of this this data that companies are collecting to. So really tying those into it and delivering on, on that strategy, which ties into like the, the data operations um, challenges uh, down below, but also kind of like a bigger thing here is like terms of service and compliance and like GDPR, right? Like there's all that space, which um, just mm -hmm. makes leveraging the data sets that you have even more and more challenging. Um, so kind mm -hmm. of playing along with that too is, is a big area that uh, leaders and businesses will need to focus on. Pretty much. And uh, I uh, pick it back on this uh, where Sabah left. So, and back to you, Jay, like, how should leaders prioritize, you know, when they're when they're playing with big data? So what are some of the priorities that leaders should be chasing when, you know, organizations start getting a lot of data, you have a lot of data to work with. So how should leaders prioritize, you know, starting working with that? Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll start with some basic question that, okay, I, I would ask myself why I'm even collecting a data. Yeah. Why are you collecting data? Yeah, yeah, very important question. What, what happens is that you know um, this both sides of collectors and the users goes independently mm -hmm. and go pretty deep, right? Um, mm -hmm. We do. I mean, as a general um, rule of thumb, we do want to collect as much as possible, so because you never know mm -hmm. what might be useful in in future as well. Mm -hmm. But but I think still um, where we where I feel the there is a gap on. Um, we are collecting data to drive a real business value, right? So I think exactly. we need to work from backwards from there, that question on mm -hmm. what do I want to do? Do I want to increase my sale or do I want to increase my marketing mm -hmm. expenses or do I want to optimize mm -hmm. certain things? What is a business priority? Mm -hmm. right? And accordingly, mm -hmm. uh, there can there needs to be um, walk, to, walk backwards to the the producer side and then you know define that this needs to be collected right making sure we don't have a gap in there mm -hmm. otherwise you collect mm -hmm. everything at the end you're like oh we don't have this bill we cannot make a prediction right so the priority always should come from what business really want to achieve so the question mm -hmm. needs to be really framed clearly what we are trying to target I think, and then okay, based okay. on that, you know, you will see that whether I want to focus more on product analytics, whether I want to do experimentation, I want to drive my user engagement, I want to increase my monthly mm -hmm. users. And be, mm -hmm. depending on that, you also, one of the things I think I'll, I'll share is that I've seen that most of the time I don't see the objectives and KPI defined for these things, which does mm -hmm. not allow you to measure and, you know, improve continuously on this. So once you do that, mm -hmm. based on the questions, it 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 makes it really clear on what should be priority and what should not. Mm -hmm. Sounds fair. Uh, Mike J says that you should know what are you gonna do. Like you should be focused on what you are going to achieve with the data you have. You know, collection is one thing, and purpose is is an entirely different thing. So, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, I think it's an interesting point um, about, and I think it's very valid start always with the product or the business strategy. And that will help mm -hmm. you understand. But I think that is on how you use the data. So you think about how am I using mm -hmm. this data to further my product or business strategy. The collection of the data, mm -hmm. it's almost you can't quite use that lens because as all of us have has experienced, we probably have gone back years and use data that mm -hmm. we, didn't, we captured five plus years ago and didn't know that it was going to be valuable today. And so <laughs> exactly. you know, oh yeah, all those images that I stored that I didn't know what I was going to use, I can use them now exactly. to train my new model for computer vision. And so 
as web two companies, like data is besides the brand, the most valuable thing. And you don't always know how you could use that data. Um, so that that's a difficult lens to use, I think, in the collection. Certainly in the um, the manipulation and usage of it, that is 100% business and product strategy. The mm-hmm. cost is interesting because what I found that costs so much isn't the like storage of the data per se, but the duplicate storage. That I've seen mm-hmm. that happen a lot where someone wants to use a particular piece of data to train a model. Well, four other teams are using the same data and they're not sharing the same uh, versions of it. They're mm-hmm. all making copies of it. And then you suddenly, your data gets really starts to get exponentially large in that. And that becomes mm-hmm. the real cost without the proper ROI because you could have had such a better ROI on all four of the projects. Um, so that's kind of, yeah, I think uh, my, my, my take on that. Pretty amazing, storing a lot of images and then not knowing what to do with those. So that's uh, that's kind of sting. Uh, so what are your thoughts, Sava, on this? Yeah, I'm in agreement with Mike. Um, I, I think, you know, it's such a, a space that is moving so quickly and it's really hard to have like that, you know, 10 year vision of like what data you're gonna need and like what data products you could build from that data. So. I'm definitely in agreement with like when in doubt, store that data if it, you know, if you can, um, because yeah. really, you know, the business right now is like if you have those data sets, that's that's the value, right? Um, so, yeah, and so storage I mean. is cheap. Um, so, yeah, I, I think you'll regret it if you're not storing that data for sure. If you're not storing it, and and you know, guys, uh, so I myself have been uh, an engineer for for quite a few years and. It took me a long, long time to be uh, in a state of mind where I started to realize the importance of data. So building is one thing, but strategizing is another thing. So we've talked about storing data. We've talked about the purpose. But Jay, what do you think is important here? Like, uh, what kind of a culture do we need in a company to be to be sure that you know we're storing the data, we're utilizing it in a way that is important and that is valuable to the business? So what sort of a culture is important to have you know these conversations or have such a mindset amongst the people you, uh, who work with us? Yeah, I think th- there definitely has been a lot has been said and tried and tested about how we can make it a data-driven culture, right? And 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 right mm-hmm. now, a lot of companies and organizations definitely values that and 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 embeds that in in some way or the another. Uh, but yeah. overall, the very basic thing is is that that. Um, the business operations and the business processes basically integrates the use of right data points to make decisions and then you know um, also come back to it and and provide the feedback to the overall big data you know uh, strategy uh, and then mm-hmm. continue to prove that in in a way right so mm-hmm. I think w- what I uh, usually stress upon is that you know because there is a lot lot of things to do. In a data-driven mm-hmm. culture, and I, I usually mm-hmm. go back to go back to the business priority, where if if there is a intent of the businesses, right, or or this mm-hmm. largely also di- differs by the size of organizations. If you are small organizations, you mm-hmm. you want to on certain things for a year or two before you jump into the next level, right? So that priority can mm-hmm. can also come from business, which again decides what we need to take up. And, and start adopting mm-hmm. to start building a data-driven culture, right? I think once people seize mm-hmm. the value of the data, it will be really easy to justify and, and invest more into the data. So we better have something that shows the value mm-hmm. right away than simply, you know, having it at, exactly. at a theoretical value. So for me, that 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 mm-hmm. kind of um, fuels and, and puts the, the culture in an iterative improvement mode where that will become more and more mm-hmm. as we go. Sounds fair. Feedback loop for the culture. You uh, you give you keep giving feedback to to have that sort of a culture. Mike, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, I, I think about um, the type of culture. The way I would sort of characterize it is, you want a learning culture because mm-hmm. learning comes from that use of the data and just like you know exactly what Jay said about the feedback loop of like. 
that if you can build that learning culture, it's always curious about, we want to learn and improve, then they are going to use that data for their operations. They're going to use that data for their business insights. They're going to use that data to feed their product okay. ideas. All mm -hmm. of that starts to build upon itself. And the other piece of the culture that I think, you know, when we talk about data that's really important is also a, um, a privacy culture that, you know, Mm -hmm. We can talk more about like the increase in regulations and concerns about privacy. I understand. But you can mm. you can view it as like we've got to do this as rules, or you can do this mm -hmm. as we should be doing it because that's what we care about. And I think that's the culture that you would we would all prefer in our organizations is not that it's mandated, but it's the right thing. We want to be respectful of people's privacy, protect their data. So I think those are the mm -hmm. types of culture cultural things that we want to think about is learning and a culture of like caring about privacy concerns. 100%. And Mike, to be very honest, privacy, is, uh, by the way, I'm probably we're also going to touch base on the privacy part as well, because that is also very, very important here. If you're storing data, if you want to use that data at some point, so privacy is definitely important. But real quick, Saba, what are your thoughts here on the culture? Yeah, I mean, uh, data-driven culture is definitely like a, a buzzword right now. Everyone says they're they're data-driven, yeah. um, but to me, like what that means is like you know at, at the leadership level, like you know the leadership team has dashboards and has the data they need to make the decisions that they need, and they're able to use that data to explain it to the rest of the organization. Mm -hmm. Right, like right from the top, mm -hmm. there you're you're driving data-driven culture, and then all the way down to like just the simple thing of, of when you're diagnosing a system and you're looking at logs, right? Like that's data. Um, so just making sure like with every single aspect of your organization and job, any mm -hmm. decision or anything that you're doing is, is data backed. Like to me, that, that is a, yeah. a data driven culture. Sounds fair. And uh, that's, that's mostly correct as well. I'm, I feel the same way. Uh, Jay, I want to touch a bit about on the privacy aspect of it, but let's just talk uh, about a, a, some broader things here. So let's say a company wants to be data-driven. They want to implement uh, strategies that make them data-driven. So what are some of the things they should do right off the bat, like and some of the pitfalls that they should avoid in your opinion? Um, I think... The number one thing is you, you should have a data organization which can which can understand the data, implement the data technology for your business, right? Um, mm -hmm. But when we start with that, I think, again, we are talking about the different stages of the organization which are in, right? To, uh, someone who's starting from scratch versus someone who's already doing it and, and wants to grow mm -hmm. and adopt like modern data technologies, right? Data stacks. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think again, uh, once we know what we want to achieve, what is our once use of, uh, yeah. what is the use of data, and, and how it will help the business. Um, uh -huh. And you know, I stress upon this point a lot because oftentimes um, you do. It's very hard to justify the investment into the data team, and that kind of kills and and kind of puts into everything into hibernate mode, and then you you are seen as a cost mm. organization than the revenue. Or helping business organization, you know, so mm. uh, that's why I, I always try to correlate with the business problems that we are solving. Um, mm. But when we decide that we need to go into this and, and we need to achieve something. I think mm -hmm. we'll, I usually prefer to keep it simple. You know, it keep it simple. Mm -hmm. We don't have to go full on. Just do mm -hmm. every layer, multiple technologies, and it will quickly make it a big mess, right? So. Instead, mm -hmm. try to keep it simple. Um, I think the the one of the biggest thing that keeps coming iteratively again and again in making these decisions in the which tech to go for is a build versus buy. You know, you don't have mm -hmm. to. I think there are a lot of right now the the evaluation and and the justification for build is very complex. I mean, it's very hard to justify when you have mm -hmm. so many. Uh, readily available, proven, well, battle tested technologies and and you know uh, solutions mm -hmm. on the market, which is much cheaper than what you would probably build yourself. So you better mm -hmm. buy that working, proven, quickly adopt, and then you know uh, put it in your overall stack, right? So build is why mm -hmm. is is one thing that that really helps organizations to quickly move on to this. 
and uh, mm-hmm. again okay if it's a small organization again starting on cloud is just you know less than a month you're up and running right um, yeah more so much thing on on prem so mm-hmm. you do have to care about i mean some depending on the organization size and the, the budget and cost that you'll incur you may have to care about whether you're going to be in a vendor locking or not whether it's really a cost effective or not so that that sometimes gets mm-hmm. quickly out of hand but i think that that uh, that is something you will learn eventually but um mm-hmm. i i would say the fastest way we can anybody can get on the big data technology to start realization of the value um would be mm-hmm. better and then mm-hmm. this world is changing every two year three year mm-hmm. there is a new technology is coming 100% right? the world so is changing we, yeah to, we need to expect that the change is inevitable and it will mm-hmm. always happen so with that in mind <laughs> you should start at something which start delivering some value and not be hung up on analysis paralysis you know not be hung up on and i'm going to steal that build versus buy like this is this is pretty amazing uh mike your thoughts companies bootstrapping on data driven strategies what are your thoughts here yeah i think one of the things that comes to mind is what leaders care about and pay attention to mm-hmm. the teams follow and so if the leaders mm-hmm. are asking questions about you know the data behind the decision or they're asking for data driven mm-hmm. decisions data driven metrics if they're having mm-hmm. meetings where they are expecting people to present based on data i think that helps infuse that culture and drives the point mm-hmm. that this is really important um mm-hmm. and then of course you know as you know as jay was talking about the you know the skills and keeping up to date i think the investment in that you know where they put their budget um where these mm-hmm. you know the leaders put their their head counts where they put their their you know cloud budgets all of that also mm-hmm. people pay attention people pay attention to all of this from a leader and so mm-hmm. i think it starts with the leaders and they can really help uh, influence this if they've got the proper mindset people will follow even if they're not you know people they can say it even implicitly just again what they pay attention to what they're asking questions about mm-hmm. people pick up on that amazing amazing it's about build versus buy what is the unbound approach here um i don't think there's like a blanket answer to be honest it's it's really a case by case uh thing but the you know what where heavy users of aws right and the services there and the offerings are are pretty robust in the data space so we leverage uh-huh. what we can um there to be honest um i think the argument for build is is getting smaller and smaller and smaller with just like what the the offerings are are out there um so it's mm-hmm. really just a more of like a, a using what's already available to kind of like get to the results that that you need mm mm-hmm. mm-hmm. yeah. amazing amazing uh you know my my note says from hasan is that uh poor data quality so we so gartner says that on average 12.9 million dollars are spent yearly on uh, on poor data quality that's new for me as well jay what is poor data here like and how does it come into play ah uh, so this is a very <laughs> wide definition the data quality you know your it, it um there is the um, the whole concept of um um like what is the right data quality for you could be a wrong mm-hmm. da- wrong data quality for me so it really depends on wrong for you yeah. mm-hmm. right um i can give you an example i mean i'm getting too much into detail here but i can have a machine learning engineers can can be mm-hmm. very well adopt to 50% blank values and incomplete values then the mm-hmm. business dashboard which is going to the ceo right so mm-hmm. it, it depends on what what who is the consumer of it but anyway to coming back to the larger question right the mm-hmm. I think <clears throat> again the kind of data we collect obviously it will be messy and very broader but as mm-hmm. it gets into the business processes and start um, start mm-hmm. being used in the consumptions it needs to be mm-hmm. we need to know the quality of the data not that it needs to be 100% uh-huh. 
quality, but you know, it needs to be according to the user of the data. So as I give uh, an example, you can have addresses of the customer in certain data set, which may not be 100% normalized and 100% accurate mm -hmm. in the geolog, you know, from mm -hmm. the geographical location perspective, right? For mm -hmm. is for the business units who are not shipping the business, who are not shipping items, mm -hmm. right? But if you are in the shipping business, an e-commerce business, that mm -hmm. is utmost priority. Most and exactly. you. you don't want to send it to exactly. a wrong location exactly. and you exactly. the lot more business. So again, the quality differs and definition of quality differs by the consumption. But I think there is mm -hmm. a layer of quality and then dimensions of quality on which typically consumers decide what is acceptable for them and what is valid mm -hmm. and what is valid for them. And, and you mm -hmm. know, I can talk on um, days on it, like, you know, the entire day on quality, <laughs> yeah. Um, and, yeah. and, and it, it, it's a collect, I mean, the buzzword is observ data observability nowadays. Um, and that is much more uh -huh. bigger than the quality because then it talks about all the way from like cataloging of data assets, the lineage of it, the data flow uh -huh. catalogs, you know, the quality of it and, and quality can include like profiling aspect of the data, which is mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. uh, the representation of how the data is versus the actual quality. And then mm -hmm. it goes on about data, right? So the observability is, mm -hmm. is key here, which, which, which gives you the overall status and health of your data organizations and data assets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. And uh, seems like who uh, it, the quality depends on the person who's consuming the data. So it, it, it uh, depend, changes from person to person. So what are your thoughts here, Mike? Yeah, I think that's really valid that, you know, this differs, the quality really matters um, based on who's consuming it. So mm -hmm. very much agree that, you know, it could, you know, whether you're using this for experimentation, making this product decisions, or you're using this for a metric or a dashboard um, for the business, mm -hmm. it could be very different. The way I've seen this in practice is things like ended up with very precise data in cases, mm -hmm. but not very accurate. And mm -hmm. it becomes a problem where you've got great precision. You've got you know, decimal points of precision with this, but it's mm -hmm. not accurate because it's measuring one small piece of something. And I think mm -hmm. that's often the case where we can get enamored with how precise we can get with data nowadays, massive quantities, massive precision, but we fail to realize that we're actually not looking at this holistically. And so therefore the accuracy of this data in the, what we're trying to do, make a decision on is very far off. I think that's the you know, one of the issues when I think about poor data quality is be careful of falling into the trap of super high precision mm -hmm. and basing that your decisions off of it mm -hmm. when you're missing a big chunk of something because mm -hmm. you might not be able to measure that as easily. That's often the case where something's yeah. really easy to measure, it's easy to collect data, therefore you make all your decisions based on it. But if you step back and realize that mm -hmm. just because you it difficult or hard to measure doesn't mean you don't need that other data. And so it's that mm -hmm. trade-off or you know, that you need both. You really want precision and accuracy. Need both. 100%, 100%. Uh, and Saba, how do you guys see poor quality data at Unbounce? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with everything Jay and Mike uh, already said. Uh, I guess maybe the little bit of a, a different perspective to add here is it's not necessarily just like the quality of the end data set, right? Like it's the quality mm -hmm. of every single uh, touch point that you know, your data goes through through your pipeline. So um, whether it's like coming in through Kinesis, so like where is there any data getting dropped there to, you know, the data processing job, like what's going on there. So it's like the new thing here is just how complex some of our pipelines are. And like, you need to really uh -huh. be looking at quality at, at every single um, step in in kind of that process and um, and then evaluating like the the final data set and the final uh, product and then of course there's uh -huh. a whole other um, issue which is with like late arriving data like how do you handle that um, how do you update your data sets with miss missing data that comes in right like that's to me is like uh -huh. even the harder problem to to address when it comes with uh, to data quality and uh, Saba just to follow up is it is it a normal thing to keep updating the data every now and then if 
you see that the quality is deteriorating or something's a mess. For sure. Yeah. I mean, like you could have a system go down and now you need to backfill your data sets, right? So mm -hmm. that's a huge data update. Um, you could have, um, uh, you know, if you're working with SDKs, for example, you could have a, a customer that like went offline for a while and then just sends you a burst of data that is late. Um, so like having mm -hmm. to kind of handle that late arriving data is, is quite complex because, you know, you have to like do data surgery at that point. Um, so uh -huh. yeah, honestly, that's, when things are move are going so well and everything is fine, it's easy, but it rarely does uh, in the world of data, especially when you're working at really large scale. <laughs> um, yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. I, I, I agree that working at Unbounce, I'm, I'm pretty sure there are kind of balls your way. Uh, Jay, privacy, something I've been meaning to talk about for a very long time. We start, I mean, at even at remote base, we started, uh, we have a data warehouse. We store a lot of data, but, Privacy is something I'm very curious about. So what are some of the lines we shouldn't step on? What is privacy? Uh, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, th this, is a, this is a topic that I, I kind of live in day in, day out. Um, oh, nice. it, it, <laughs> I think you, um, probably the basic one that I started to like, you know, I think um, there, there are growing regulations about what you should be collecting, how you should be collecting, mm -hmm be storing and how you should be using it and not only that the government's also new, wants to know who has mm -hmm. actually yeah yeah they're very very interested to has know used it, and, you know yeah. so there is a lot of regulations around all of this right from mm -hmm. all the way from mm -hmm. collection of the data to all the way from uh, to up to user usage of the data and mm -hmm. also about how much you can sell how much you're sharing with third party <laughs> Nothing from third party. Yeah. First party data collection versus third party data collection. All of this is it's a pretty big world. And um, so uh, that's a, that's a outside of organizations. And I mean, um, that's a one layer. The another layer is that once we have the data, I think from the data platform and service perspective, what is important for us is to classify this data sets in a way that makes mm -hmm. it manageable. So you mm -hmm. do want to classify each of these data elements into the sensitive data elements, class one to all the way up to five, and then mm -hmm. treat them accordingly, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, you don't store class one at all, but when you have a class three data, you have to make sure mm. that it's not available to even anybody in the company. It's limited folks who would have nice. internet access, nice. and they are under uh -huh. the audit, they are under the regulations, uh -huh. and all uh -huh. of that. So privacy is that uh, also like within the company, of course, GDPR and CCPA and you know Singapore regulations and all European regulations. Many every country now has its own regulation. Yeah. helps. Yeah, um, uh, prioritize some of these things and uh -huh. also structure how we do things in the big data world, right? Uh, but exactly. I would say really costly. It's a it's a costly, uh, very effortful um, thing to do, and uh, uh -huh. keeping an eye on privacy. Uh -huh. And you know, security is something similar, but we'll <laughs> we'll touch later maybe. But but privacy, mm -hmm. I think one of the thing I, I stress upon is is a monitoring aspect of the privacy, right? So you mm -hmm. you again you have a left hand and the right hand situation in the company where um, you are storing the data. You want to what you want to make sure is that you are storing all the um, you know sensitive elements in the right way. Um, mm -hmm and your data stack is structured accordingly um, mm -hmm. and not everybody has access to, right? So mm -hmm. pretty amazing what... the way you classify data and you touched upon the, the fact that, you know, we can, we can sell data as well. And I'd want to discuss further, like, where do you draw the line? But before we go there, Mike, what are your thoughts here on the privacy? Yeah, um, as we've mentioned, uh, there's definitely yeah, we've got regulations that exist today. There's also increased regulations that we expect we're mm -hmm. going to continue to come about. But mm -hmm. the way that I think about privacy is not that we've got to be compliant with regulations, but rather, okay. more importantly, it could be a strategic differentiator. And okay. you know, the, just like we have a culture of accessibility you, and quality, you can't mm -hmm. put those things in at the end. And I think the same thing mm -hmm. about privacy. You can't just tack it on. You really need this 
part of your processes and culture and build it into the organization in the beginning. And the way to do that is to think about this as a strategic differentiator. That think about mm-hmm. you know, just like we have, we've done in the past with quality and we've done with accessibility. Instead of thinking about these as like must-haves or add-ons at the end, mm-hmm. bring them up front and say they are going to be a strategic differentiator for our company, and they are part of our core culture and our processes of building products and how we handle data. Pretty much, pretty much. And uh, if we talk about PayPal, they deal with a lot of sensitive data. But uh, if we talk about a company like Unbound, so is it the same with in terms of privacy, Sabah, or is it is it slightly different? Oh, it's yeah. I actually I really like Mike's answer to this. So it's it's really about like the culture that you're driving in terms of not being a jerk with people's data. To be honest, like you're, it's just <laughs> handling uh, the data in a in a right way. So really paying attention to where PII data is being used and how it's being stored. Um, making sure you're working with anonymized data aggregates when mm-hmm. you can, right? Like all of those yeah. like really basic uh, good data handling culture. Mm-hmm. Um, so if, if that is part of your company and part of the culture, you're gonna be already really well set up. And then of course, mm-hmm. aligning with all of the regulations. Um, what's interesting with the regulations is that, you know, those are changing so quickly. Like, I don't know if you've seen yeah. lately, but like even like the way, you know, the cookie banner that shows up on every website, right? Like GDPR actually ruled yeah. that that was not GDPR compliant, right? And where everyone does that. <laughs> so it's, it's a little bit yeah. of a, a really evolving space. And if you, uh-huh. um, you'll be really well set up if you as a company are investing that in your culture and in your processes and supporting the security team and, and your InfoSec team and like making sure to have the resources and the time to pay attention to that. Um, mm-hmm. I think you'll you'll be really well set up there. Yes. Amazing, amazing. Jay, difficult question your way. What's your take on selling data to the third party? Like, where do you draw the line? So I think um, I, I mentioned that as part of the overall privacy concerns, uh, things, um, um, there was recently news that, you know, there is a, there is a, it's a big business about like data broker selling uh, yeah. certain data, like third party data. And every business actually does collect some amount of third party data, which helps their yeah. business um, or, or stitch together a overall picture of, uh, you know, the profiling of users, which which helps them make certain decisions, right? So not necessarily, uh, you know, connecting any dots here, but um, mm-hmm. data sharing is is a is one of those things that I think will 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 see that uh, more of regulations. Um, mm-hmm. I think from privacy perspective, right? Just to say that uh, about the sh- uh, collection, right? Mm-hmm. Even like simple. Um, a geolocation collecting like geolocation of the user is sensitive and considered as a privacy yeah, yeah. um the the open privacy group considered that as a as not a right for any organizations to collect mm-hmm. this is mm-hmm. where we see the battle on whether organization is saying okay this is my user i want to i want to provide yeah. them um yeah, yeah, yeah. experience by collecting mm-hmm. certain information so i think that the line is very very blurry right now and that's where we are seeing a lot of challenges because of that. The, the ever-changing regulations is because we don't have a clarity in the space and mm-hmm. everybody's trying to draw a line uh, on where that mm-hmm. goes between the organizations and the, and, the, and the open privacy groups and government, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. for me, I think the data sharing is completely um, good as long as it's, again, done under the regulations with transparency okay. and, uh, you know, mm-hmm. with uh, for mm-hmm. the for the betterment of the business, right? Um, mm-hmm. And uh, as as Sabat touched upon that, you know, if we are um, abusing any p- part of the data elements uh, about the users and you know being jerked to that data, that that's not a good mm-hmm. thing. I, I'm hopeful that the government's regulations prevents uh, that, and then you know uh, helps there uh, bring clarity on what we should do with the data, what we should not. Hundred percent. And Mike. Jay just said that data sharing is fine uh, if you're following yeah. regulations and all. Well, let's yeah. take I, I think you know, we're certainly going to see more regulations that are going to force mm-hmm. companies to, you know, like uh, you no longer use third party cookies and stuff. 
Um, but I, I think about it again, like I think about the sort of privacy that if you, and just using sort of my definitions, other might have different, but like mm -hmm. a web two company is all about mm -hmm. the data. That is the most valuable, right? If you think about many of our okay. companies, mm -hmm. the features you can look online and see and copy those. What you can't copy is that data. That's what makes it powerful. And many of us use that data back in our products. We make use decisions. So web two companies, the data is super valuable. In a Web3 company, you know, kind of, mm -hmm. you know, think about it, data is not their value. It's not theirs. It's not as valuable. They have to find value mm -hmm. some other ways, the transactions. And not, we're going to have Web2 companies for decades. Um, so they're not going away. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they provide mm -hmm. valuable services. But I do think they could benefit from thinking more about data from a Web3 perspective. That this data mm -hmm. is, you know, should be owned by users and protected from that. And how do we allow them? So again, not, you know, the regulations are a good, I think, a minimal, but I would challenge those, you know, Web2 companies to go beyond that and think about it as mm -hmm. the industry is moving towards this kind of Web3 because people care about their data and they, they want to own it and they want to protect it. They want to be able to move it, take it from one social network to another. Or they want to take their medical records from one physician to another and not, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. not have a company own that data and get value out of it. So I think even though we're going to continue to see Web2, we can do better by thinking about this from a mindset of these Web3 companies, even though we don't have to change dramatically. We just think about it from their perspective. 100%. Mike has touched upon a really important uh, topic here, you know, Web2 versus Web3, and probably that's something I'm gonna, I would want to, I would love to discuss in the you know, next question. But before that, Sabha, what, what's your take here about data sharing and all? Do you guys share data at Unmouth? Oh, sorry, what was the last part? Uh, I, do you guys do share I, Do data? we share data at Unmouth? Um, I mean, I guess it, it, dep it depends on the definition of data sharing, but um, so like selling data products if you think about it, at the end of the day, you're, you're collecting people's data, right? And then you're making money off uh, of it. Like, really, that's at the end mm -hmm. of the day what, what's happening here, right? So I think the key thing to unlock and, like, make sure your customers are, are along with, for the ride with this is that you need to explain of, like, what is the benefit for them, right? So if you can sell mm -hmm. um, data products or data-driven um, features that have a feedback loop, right? So that, you know, your customers are actually benefiting from the, mm -hmm. the data collection. So at Mapbox in my previous job, for example, we collected the data to mm -hmm. improve the map, right? So um, mm -hmm. to the customer, it's a no brainer for them to give you their data. Mm -hmm. So um, kind of like communicating that and making sure it is in the customer's benefit to give you that data and they see the value in it. It just makes your, your job mm -hmm. a lot easier when it comes to, to selling these like data backed features. Makes your job easier. Guys, I've been told that we're out of time. By the way, I want you to touch upon Web2 versus Web3, especially with PayPal. It's been a Web2 company for a very long time and how the transition is going to affect us. But, uh, okay, one more question. Web2 versus Web3J, what's your take here? PayPal has been uh, a Web2 company for a very long time. And now uh, with the advent of Web3, the way we share data, the way we work with data is changing. So what's your take here? So how is it changing? Um, I'm certainly not not speaking on behalf of PayPal and not going to be able to share any oh, yeah. Yeah, obviously, information obviously, obviously. what's going on at PayPal. But I think in general, between Web 2 and 3, it's it's really interesting space. And, and I think it can address a lot of this aspect as Mike, uh, Mike touched upon. Um, mm -hmm. I think it, in, in the particularly in the privacy and security area, it can mm -hmm. put control back in user's hand where user mm -hmm. control everything user's hand, yeah. there are a lot yeah. of new interesting um you know uh, technologies that is being developed in web3 which allows mm -hmm. you to imagine that your social uh, media data is in your hand you can go from mm -hmm. one app to another in the flip of a mm -hmm. day yeah uh, and still be continuously use the other things right as as you move on you don't have Mm -hmm. from scratch so it's like mm -hmm. whether it's the facebook or whether it was myspace or facebook or instagram anybody um you mm -hmm. own your data if i think 
um, as Sabha also mentioned, that if user understands the value of it and at the same time mm -hmm. has a confidence that he, con he or she controls the data, that mm -hmm. would, would definitely help solve some of this, um, you know. Solve some of these problems, yeah. We are in, in a deadlock situation otherwise, right? So yeah, uh, it yeah. would definitely help there. But Web3, uh, I mean, from privacy perspective, that is definitely helping. But, you know, um, and from scale perspective to bring the transparency. So it's, I think it's, mm -hmm. it's going to help in, in, in a lot of these areas overall. Mm -hmm. That's why it's, I guess, considered as a next version of the internet and, and web technology and web in general so that um, things operate differently in that world, um, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. address concern. At the same time, we improve upon some of these things, which is not mm -hmm. doable which is not addressable in Web2 and before. So, and it's the next version of the internet, Mike. Right. The tough one to top, huh? Yeah, no, that's a good... I don't think it's realistic to ask Web2 companies to change their business model, right? That's just not going to happen. It's, it's, it's too yeah. much. Yeah. Um, but as I was saying, there is a perspective to adopt from a Web3 perspective that companies should... And then there's even opportunities. You know, if we go back to some of our previous conversations and questions about um, like things like cost of data, Web2 mm -hmm. companies, a lot of us gather all this data, we store it, but then we have to send it out, maybe for advertising mm -hmm. with partners because we want to mm -hmm. advertise. Mm -hmm. All of that cost. Mm -hmm. And there are opportunities for us to rethink that to say, well, it's silly. I'm collecting all this data, storing it, and then send it away when I could be using Web3 mm -hmm. technologies to not have to store all that data myself, not have to ship all that data, you know, you know, multiple times a day. And then as mm -hmm. I was saying, sometimes you have to backfill all this. So I do think there's opportunities for Web2 companies mm -hmm. to even adopt some of the Web3 technologies, um, you know, for some of this data that isn't, they already share. They're, they're sharing purposely with, with partners for advertisements and stuff, you know, to advertise this stuff. So I think uh, mm -hmm. there's a way that we can be more advanced, leaning in towards the Web3, mm -hmm. both from a perspective and occasionally in technology and data sharing. Amazing, amazing. Sabah, any final thoughts here before we wrap this thing up? No, just, yeah, totally in agreement. There's, there's definitely a ton of opportunity here to uh, take off a lot of uh, off the plate for companies. The, the one area that really worries me is like, um, it is just the uncertainty that it introduces to your product okay. and to your company. Um, so oh, I think yeah. that's going to oh, be yeah. like a, a really hard uh, space to navigate for, for Web2 companies, for sure. For sure, for sure, yeah. Uh, thank you, guys. This has been amazing. This has been truly phenomenal. Mm -hmm.